Grand Rising, my friends. Welcome back. For those who are new, welcome. For those who have joined me on one or several of these, welcome back. Today, we're going to kind of discuss how going forth in this next decade, there's going to be a lot of financial growth. It's going to be changing of industries. So we're going to try to stay one step ahead of where we need to be so that we can capitalize on what's coming next in the future. Um, like always, I say this is about positivity. We want to play it forward. So if you want to say something nice about someone in your life that you love, respect, admire, and in the comment section, write something nice about them and then send them this video and say, hey, go check the comment section. I wrote something about you. Go look for it. Right now, it's pretty easy. There's nothing, not much in the comment section, but hopefully that'll change in the future. Or maybe not. It's fine. Just be uh, the, uh, those, of us, uh, those of us who are here having fun. Um, without much more, let's get into today's, not, well, today where I'm at, and it's kind of been a couple of days. This, I upload these um, every morning at 6 a.m., uh, but I may record them the night before. I'm... Probably not. It's too. I don't want to chance and try to record day of or someday. I mean, I don't have to do it every day, but uh, some days I may, uh, if I'm, you know, can get everything set up, record day of. But for the most part, to record at least a day or two before, um, trying to still work things out. Thinking on weekends, like I said, more deep dive into various topics. I may start on the weekends, but. We're going with Grand Rising Rounds because it's like Grand Rising instead of morning. I'm going to do a video um, on here to go through all of this, but um, we say Grand Rising instead of morning. Morning is a, a sign of mourning, of sadness, so we want you to be happy and excited. My mom used to always say to us, rise and shine. So, and But I didn't come up with Grand Rising. Other people did, but I like the term, and my friends use it, so Grand Rising to each other. And I use rounds because I conduct morning rounds with people. We used to do daily rounds, morning rounds, and using that as a way of kind of, we would talk about business as well, but also go through different things that um, were happening in the world or thoughts. And so this is a way of kind of recreating that experience for other people because a lot of people tell me they enjoyed it. Wall Street is the most bullish on stocks in almost two decades. I tell you, it's, we were supposed to be having a great summer right now. And um, I'm not going to go too much in depth about the uh, pandemic and everything, but we were supposed to have a great summer and be moving. Into this. We'll, we'll, I still think we are, and um, not so much have a great summer. There's a lot of uh, things happen, but I don't anticipate us having as worse a time as we did last year. Um, the way this is going, I don't see it escalating worse and worse and worse. I see it hopefully start to get better for, um, you know, not just our country in America here, but the world. It's been two decades since Wall Street analysis were this upbeat. About 56 percent of all recommendations on S&P 500 firms are listed as buys. And for those who are not too clear on that, the S&P 500 is one of the stock exchanges, Standard & Poor, I think is with s and you know, double check on that, I probably will after this because I said it now. But they pick 500 firms that they keep a track of indices on, and that's one of the exchanges that we consider in the stock market. Um, you can invest directly in the indices of the S&P 500, and it's known to be a great investment uh, strategy where there is ETFs, the exchange traded funds we discussed, that specifically pick either, you know, this is, uh, electrically, uh, electronic traded fund can, um, exchange traded fund can have, you know, you can have one in healthcare, one in uh, energy, and anything you think of, cannabis. Uh, they have uh, plenty of things that you can have, and they have one that uh, directly tracks the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 is one of the exchanges. So if it goes up over time, the investment goes up over time and is known to be one of the one of the better strategies is just put your money in one of the ETFs that track the S&P 500 itself 
or the Dow Jones or the entire stock market or the NASDAQ. These are strategies that people employ to make long term generational growth and wealth is what we're talking about here. So uh, 50 per six, 56 percent of all recommendations on the S&P 500 are listed as buy. So that means, you know, as they're saying, more than half the companies they are saying buy their stock right now. The most since 2002. It's one more data point that shows the extent of euphoria sweeping markets after a blockbuster earnings season. Now, one thing, and I will set this up another time, is that when you usually see euphoria, that's usually right before a big crash. <laughs> so I don't like the word, that use of the word euphoria, because uh, that's usually one of the signs that a market is going to suffer a correction is euphoria. So. Be mindful of that. While analysts are historically a bullish bunch, they're turning even more optimistic in the face of relentless stock market gains and corporate earnings. When they say bullish, the, the two animals that people use to describe the markets are bulls and bears. Bulls like when the market go up and they look for they're rushing to rush to move on. And bears like to hold on and stay slow and move slow and expect the market to either stay where it's at or to drop down. So when you hear people talk about the bulls and bears, that's what a lot of the times, you know, that's that's what it means. But da -da 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 -da, face of stock, stock and the corporate earnings, you know, highest expectations for all the concerns about the Delta variant, China's regulatory crackdown or waning Federal Reserve stimulus. It hasn't made much of a dent yet on stock prices. And they said it's also not just U.S. companies. U.S. companies aren't the only one feeling the love in Europe. About 52 percent of recommendations on Stokes, stock, 600 firms are buy or equivalent, a 10 year high in Asia. The number jumps to 75 percent, the highest proportion since at least 2010. So it's a global phenomenon and it fits back to, you know, one of my hypotheses of where the um, country and uh, the world is going in this next um, decade is going to be a lot of growth. Like we were in the information age or the industrial age, and now we're in um, the industrial revolution. Now we're in the information revolution. And that information is going to change everything from healthcare to uh, retail service, transportation. Every, every aspect of our lives are going to be touched by the uh, tremendous growth. Amazon bid for MGM to get a FTC antitrust review. The Federal Trade Commission, which is the FTC. So Amazon's $8.5 billion deal to acquire MGM will be subject to an antitrust review by the Federal Trade Commission. And I think that a lot of this stuff is mostly uh, standard and um, routine because the way the streaming services, anybody knows now is such diversity to choose from that MGM merging with Amazon is not going to become now a monopoly that's going to if Disney is allowed to buy Fox <laughs> that was but that did take some time to go through but it, it, it you know it went through so Amazon will be allowed to buy MGM which would give them access to its well-stocked library of 4,000 movies and 17,000 TV shows so we can look forward to seeing Amazon being able to make some new franchises with James Bond, Rocky. So if anyone was paying attention and saw how, and remember, any advice in here is not financial advice. This is not health advice. This is not, hey. <laughs> And the reason, if you don't know the reason why people always get say that is because people are so litigious in our society. They like to sue so much. And like, you told me to do this and that. I didn't tell you to do anything. I'm not even telling you what I'm doing. Because don't ask me anything. You know, I to, we had that discussion when you get into this and your friends and they be like, what, what should I sell? Like, like look, look, hey, no, 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 no. You will not be blaming me for your problems in the future. You got to make that decision yourself. But... Me looking at this, or I, this individual here looking at this, sees that Disney, when they merged with Fox, they went up almost, what, 50%, a third since then? 
you know. Granted, you know, it's Disney and Fox, you know, and how Amazon, and so remember, Amazon, this is not even their main business. <laughs> This is Amazon. We talked about Amazon with the web services and their uh, the contracts they're getting in the cloud computing. Besides the retail, this is the streaming service. But you know, Disney was known as the, the theme parks and movies, and now it's uh, the streaming service as well. So a lot of these companies, the ones one um, I will give you this bit of nugget. I use an expression with people is don't make blockbuster decisions in the Netflix world. And I, you know, I was doing that at various times in my life where you would be around individuals who did not understand that time was moving past them. So, and it can apply to anything. Don't make blockbusters. Don't make my space decisions in the Facebook world. You, whatever you want to think of it as. So, Amazon, publicly traded company, making that deal that potentially can increase its value in the future. And you can buy fractional shares of something. I mean, look, Amazon, I'm not sure how much it's worth today, but it was in the three, three thousands. You don't have to buy a whole share if you can't right away. Man, but you can easily, and we'll talk about that when we talk about dollars cost averaging, but uh, that's one of the ones you could easily be putting in, uh, you know, whatever it may be, a percentage of however much you put into the market that you can uh, for Amazon, even if it's just uh, $20 a month, $10 a month, you just want pieces and you eventually get to a hole. It's, it's not, you're not one step gets you to that thousand miles. Everybody want to just immediately jump there. Talk about immediately jumping there. Crypto is no longer in the early adoption stage. And I'm not sure how much I agree with this. You know, when you look at the, the, the advent of any new technology, there's going to be like the, the, the super rushed in, the first ones who hear about it. You know, the individuals who are just, you know, beyond in the know, if not part of the creation of their round at the uh, very beginning in the um, first uh, hints that come out. Then you have the early adopters that are the people who get in early enough and they're, you know, hip enough to whatever the technology is of or whatever, you know, the, the thing we're talking about it could be fashion, not necessarily be technology, be anything. The early adopters, those who see can see trends before they happen and um, kind of catch that wave. Then it goes off into the mainstream. Now, crypto for years and even now, I'm saying I, I argue we may still be in early adoption. Uh, Bittrex, a global CEO, and, his, and his, you know, of course, he wants to get the, um, and, and, and most of this is just speaking uh, truth into reality or trying to speak this truth into reality, this, you know, this this wish into reality where, yeah, of course we remain adopted, of course. Of course, we uh, there's a ma uh, mainstream adoption of crypto. Are you kidding me? It's been mainstream adopted for years. That's, look, we have big, giant companies and, and billions and trillions, down $2 trillion of uh, capital in the market. So the crypto industry began with Bitcoin's launch in 2009, flowering into a bustling industry filled with many different assets and blockchain solutions in the years following. The sector, however, is no longer in its infancy, according to Bittrex Global CEO, Stefan or Steven Stoneberg. I think we're already past the stage of crypto early adoption. Crypto has gone mainstream. We have double digit Percentage adoption in both developed and developing company countries. We even have Bitcoin adopted as a legal tender in a country. And many other countries are considering adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Hey, look, I, you can't argue with progress. And I'm not for a tenth of a second. I just still think that a lot of people don't quite understand. And, and they may never will. You know, if you start talking to people about them, uh, how money works. And even I'll say even myself for a long time. No clue. No clue. Thought I did. Thought or thought I had some sense. But. You know, what we're taught in our public high schools in America and with a lot of the generation above us passed down to us was not much in this. So that is our goal. And one of my goals is to educate about financial literacy so that you can have financial independence and generational wealth for you and yours. Because as I tell people a lot of times, money doesn't make you happy, but the lack of it don't help either. So. At the commercial level, we're also seeing big changes, talking about how AMC and Venmo are now accepting um, 
Bitcoin, and, and I'm going to uh, touch on this uh, uh, later on in the week about some other company, giant, giant companies who are um, jumping into the ring. And it's, 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 it's happening, you know, and I, I'm not, we're not saying it's not. I still think it's really early. And, you know, I think that's something else we're going to talk about a little bit later this week as well is, is it too late to get into Bitcoin? And the answer is no. When people used to ask me that, this is years ago, they'd be like, oh, is, this, is it too late now? I say, is it a million dollars yet? Because that's when I'm going to stop probably a dollar cost averaging. When it's around, a, when it get close to a million bucks per coin, I'll be like, all right, I'm, I'm good. I'm good now. So is it a million dollars of a coin yet? Then, then what you're talking to me, why are you asking me, is it, is it too late? Because no, it's not. If, it's, if it ain't a million dollars yet, it ain't too late. And I believe it's going to go higher than that, but. I don't really have like a price price prediction videos. I, I'm not, you know, that ain't that ain't your boy. <laughs> My friends and I are um, in the midst of this joke with each other, and I, I'm tempted <laughs> to, to 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 say what we say in our jokes. But no, these 13 banks have invested the most in crypto and blockchain to date. Financial institutions are grabbing. For a piece of the booming two trillion cryptocurrency market with 13 of the world's largest banks pushing roughly three billion in funding. That is nothing out of two trillion. Three bill be one point five percent. No, that'd be out of a thousand. That's zero point one five zero point one five. I messed up the other day and said that um, seven million instead of six million, but it was six million. But I think this would be 0.15%. Uh, and I'll double check myself after this. But anyway, $3 billion in funding so far to cryptocurrency and blockchain companies, according to the analytics company Block Data. The data firm, in an updated report this week, published a list of 13 banks that lead in terms of size of funding rounds as a proxy of investment into the crypto space, saying it used that measure as banks participating in funding rounds with multiple or many other investors. So let's get to it. Now play around. Standard Charter. It's a bank in England. Not too familiar with it, but it's the most has the most invested. It includes with Ripple, da, 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 da. and Cobalt, a trading technology based in UK. It doesn't say. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Right here, 380 million with six investments. BNY Mellon, which is the oldest bank in the United States, 320. Citibank. I'm not gonna go through all these. All these. UBS. Morgan Stanley, Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs. Oh, oh, everybody in here, everybody coming to get to play. The Japanese, the Dutch, the Spanish. Everybody coming to play. And you think this is what's called smart money. Where's the smart money at? And you should be there, too. You don't even have to know much. So all you got to do is just pay attention and say, OK, the smart money doing that. Need me black like, bubble. I don't understand that. Who cares? That's what the smart people are doing. Learn more and then, you know, hopefully, you know, you could be there one day and outsmart them. But for me, like I was like, OK, let me get away from my, how I think the world works, because a lot of it is. And we'll talk about this, the psychology of an investing and how we're taught almost because, you know, and it's, it's not by. It's by design. It's not by accident. We're taught to think like uh, individuals who will never make this wealth. We're programmed to not to make mistakes and not um, when I say we and they and stuff, you know, my conspiracy people know what time that is. <laughs> no, when I say it's um, I don't know who the they is. That's, a, you know, hey, we can argue about that. That's a, a 19 hour video series about who they are. But the we is the vast majority of us, you know. But. So a lot of banks are getting involved in um, blockchain and the cryptocurrency market, and they have been for years. 55% of the world's top banks are investing in crypto, and it's only going to grow. Remember, I talk about game theory. If, once one bank did it, the other banks are like, well, what if, it, what if it do go to the moon and I'm not on for that ride? Oh, no, 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 no. We got to get it. You know, that's, that's, that's the mentality. You know, they, they have the same psychological weaknesses we have just in institutions fomo and such but you have some people who are just also um going to do the opposite of whatever they should do just because they feel they need to be a rebel and they end up losing out they but is that a you know now we get into a deep philosophical religious is that a 
a part of their karma to replay, to make bad, you know, to um, sabotage themselves so they have to replay this again. You know, I don't know if we're going to make videos about stuff like that. <laughs> That's another story. All right. Let me get on and we're going to finish these last couple stories out looking at to the future and how the things we talked about um, are coming to pass. Ten years ago, this was science fiction, the rise of weed killing robots. So this robot here is able to. Uh, I read it here. Carbon robotics in common with with other agro robotic startups emphasizes the environmental benefits these machines can bring to farming by helping to reduce soil disturbance, which can contribute to erosion and allowing farmers to heavily reduce or even eradicate the use of herbicides. Because this machine here basically began using two robots last year to weed his 12 hectare acre, 30 acre crop. The robots, which are nearly three meters long, weigh about, well, this is a, most, I think most people in America need to know America stuff. So this is about almost about 10 feet, about 10 feet long, three meters, nine feet, 10 feet long, and weigh about almost 10,000 pounds. So it was a big boy. And resembles a small car. Clamber slowly across a field, scanning beneath them for weeds, which you can then target with laser bursts. For microseconds, you watch this reddish color burst. You see the weed. It lights up as the laser hits it, and it's just gone. So they, you know, we have robots now that are going to grow through um, fields and able to take out all the, all the weeds or, you know, vast majority of the weeds without the use of pesticides. I'm sorry, herbicides. And they're also talking about using the, these vehicles um, to also get rid of pesticides. And this is, you know, I'm not, we're not trying to sell this vehicle. The part of it is that robots are, are going to change, be one of the things, robotics and uh, the uh, automization of a lot of these labors that we as humans used to do is going to change our society not only is it they're finding it hard to find people they don't have to worry about that anymore and these robots can work 24 hours a day you're going to have to have people repaired so that'll be, you know be the job and programmers um right here farmwise found his first customers in california's Salinas Valley, which grows lettuce, broccoli, California strawberries, and is known as America's Salad Bowl. Most people don't know that most of our produce in America comes from California. And so with the wildfires and all the other problems there, that hurts us. Any part of America get hurts hurts us. And so, you know, I just I have my beliefs and my opinions about things, and I, but I've always thought of seeing myself as an American, even as when it's been difficult plenty of times in this country. But I see myself as an American, and you want America, Americans to want America to do well. So we need to work together at all times. But understanding the machines come and take a lot of people's jobs, and we have to figure out what we're going to do next. Is that going to be universal basic income? It becomes a lot of things to think about. So they're getting better with robots who will be able to grow all of our food. And I, I joke and tell my friends, they would love the day when they can just put a box in the field and it just builds itself into a McDonald's that runs itself with no humans involved. You just put the box in the field and it'll, it'll build everything up. Give it some time. Give it a day or two. Your McDonald's will be ready and serving people or any other fast food place. But the good things of the and, and, and that's a good thing in a way like that um, it's going to cause a abundancy in our society and is, is how we approach that. And so I like to think about these things early. So how we approach that is going to be if we we crumble under it or we uh, it, it creates it helps us to achieve those goals of traveling out into uh, space, be it our solar system, different different galaxies, different solar systems, hopefully different galaxies one day. But if not, we, we make ourselves here better. So that's kind of the, the thought of, you know, plan to make yourself super incredible. And then if you don't get there, you still at least are oh, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. AI analyzed gray matter to loss to predict the onset of Alzheimer's. And this they're using, I'll just read a little bit of it. 
Advances in artificial intelligence promise to open up all sorts of possibilities when it comes to healthcare. and analyzing medical images for sign of trouble is already pro pro proving to be a great strength of the technology. Scientists at Cambridge University have demonstrated a new type of machine learning algorithm they say can detect structural changes in the brain that are indicative of early dementia and can be combined with standard memory tests to calculate the likelihood of someone going on to develop Alzheimer's. And that's basically it. They look for structural changes in the brain, um, which is awesome. That that's we're able to get scans of the brain, and for the, the most part, unless there is a big gaping problem, there's not much we get out of it. Most most things come back is is is, is pretty non uh, you know inconclusive. So the artificial intelligence and it's going to change, and it's going to be a topic we'll we'll discuss as well. It's going to revolutionize medicine from radiology to pathology, which I think will be kind of the first to be the, the, the computers will be able to co-op in a way to surgery, same way we uh, are using artificial intelligence and robotics to replace labor in the field. It'll be able, now a lot of, and a lot of it will come, they'll be able to figure out the, when variants occur, when variations occur and you got to think on the fly, but surgery um, in psychiatry, I, I wonder, you know, if the if the algorithms will be good enough to do that job. Now, from a therapeutic standpoint, therapy, yes, but to the understanding from a psychiatric standpoint, and then and the correctly identifying what people are trying to say, even when they don't know they're lying to you. That's a big part of psychiatry is that individuals are not, I don't want to say lying, but they built, have programming and built up these stories. And in those stories, they think this is what you want to hear as the physician. And you have to be astute enough to recognize that and get to the truth of the matter to really help individuals. You end up prescribing, you know, all types of wrong medications if you just went off with people, the words people said and not been able to kind of figure out what the real hidden meaning was, the unconscious meaning and, and, and what was being said here nor there. But so artificial intelligence is going to really change the way we practice medicine. It's going to um, create, cause people to live longer, live healthier. That combined with genetic engineering, and I'll talk about this more later. I, don't, I probably should just repeat this stuff over and over again and hammer it into people's heads. I tend to think, like, I don't want to repeat myself, but hey, some of you, some of you have never even heard my voice before, so now you're hearing this for the first time. But I tell them, I tell my friends and, and people I work with, I say, what happens when they come to you, when they come to you, they, when they come to you? And they say, what age do you want to be? You want to be 21? You want to go back? You want to go back to 28? What age do you want to be? Now, we don't let people go by under 18, but up to the age of 18, what age do you want to be? We'll give you your cocktail and maybe you'll pay us 700 a month, maybe 3000 a month. But how much is that worth to you? And everybody's like, oh, no, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not, I say, yeah, you say that now. But when, when you start seeing your, your spouse go there or your friend, or what, what if that, that, that person you thought your spouse maybe someone attracted to is now 30, 40 years younger? What do you do then? What happens when they come to you and say, what age you want to be? And that's where we're going with the artificial intelligence and genetic engineering. We're looking at a way to, in real time, be able to manipulate our DNA, which is basically your instruction booklet for the body. And you go back there and just use yours, not a different person, it's your instruction booklet. Let's just go back there and, re and, and, and turn back the pages to when it was um, reading and writing off the, the instructions from a certain error. And, you know, now that we have that ability, we can easily turn that back. How much is that worth to you? And so when I say this, you know, everybody at first is like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not. And then when they, you know, sitting like, you know, and, and you know, I don't want to live forever. Like, yeah, we say that, you know, and, I, and, we, probably, and we probably don't. <laughs> but what happens when they start? I'm sure people were saying when they, I'm not riding that, that vehicle, that metal vehicle. That's a depth trap. I'm sure we heard that about planes, trains, and automobiles. So in this study, they were able to seem to get almost a five to 10 year 
window of being able to see individuals who may develop going 80 percent chance so i mean it's pretty good and as the technology get better and algorithms get better it'll get um uh, far more sensitive the um so i'm excited about where we're going you know you have a way to see things you can be afraid about what's going to happen or you can decide to make it work for you and that's what I want us to discuss here at all times is how we're going to make this work for us. What way do we see of being improving of, upon this information? How do we how do we take this information in and become better human beings from it? Because to me, that's what God wants from us. Hey, I love you. You love you. And God loves us. And that's all that matters.